welcome everybody. We are waiting a bit until everybody, if people stop coming in. We have a little bit of a technical issue. <laughs> so uh, give us five more minutes or three more minutes and I think then we are ready for takeoff. <clears throat> <laughs> wow. <laughs> you. Can you make me the host again? Yeah. Thank you. I try. Ha, mehr. Ja. Host. Co bist du dann co-host? Uh, host would be better. Okay. Yes, yes please. <clears throat> Okay, Gregor, I think the floor is yours. Do yes. You have... um, so, welcome everyone. Um, it's nice to have you all here for the EEA, EAYE panel on how to survive the job market. And I see that, that uh, many of you have already started answering our polls and I'm really happy that you do that. So, um, I'm just going to wait a little bit uh, for for uh, some stable equilibrium until the majority of you has answered the, uh, the questions. So I hope that you can all see my slides. Can you? Okay, yes. that's great. Um, yeah. So um, what is the European Association of Young Economists? Um, um, we are a, an association by young economists, like everyone below the age, at the age of 35, um, for young economists. And what we do here is, um, for example, this EEA panel. So this is now the second time that we are doing a panel on the academic job market. We have also done panels on how to publish a paper and um, what is good scientific practice and stuff like that. Um, we're doing the spring meeting of young economists. That's a large conference with 150 to 180 participants once a year. Next year, it's going to be in Bologna. So um, please submit your papers and come there. Then we've started two years ago a uh, workshop uh, on a very specific topic that is much smaller, uh, much more interaction and much more topical. We share lots of advice on our website, um, which is not only related to, to what we discuss in our EEA panels, but also other advice and of course, uh, you can uh, follow our Twitter account to get uh, some knowledge on important conferences. So where do you find us? Um, on our website is eaye.weebly.com and then we are on Facebook, on Twitter and on LinkedIn. So, so much for our self-advertisements. Now for the advertisement of our, uh, of our great panelists. Uh, this year we have four panelists, Nesi Guna, Eliana La Ferrara, Chris Roth and Paolo Pinotti. Um, all four, needless to say, have published in top journals um, and they have also done a couple of other things. So I'm not going to spend too much time on what they are doing in terms of research and where they have all published their papers because that is something that you can all read on their beautiful CVs. Um, I'm going to talk more about what sort of experience I expect them to have uh, with the job market. So Eliana has, ha uh, has finished her PhD in Harvard in 1999 and then moved to Bocconi um, afterwards with some stays in between somewhere else. So she has been hiring for a couple of years and I expect her to have uh, had very good job market training from Harvard. From Harvard. 
she also has been EEA president in 2018. Um, and something that I, that I found when I looked that up a couple of days ago was that she retweeted uh, a blog post on communication culture in economics, which I found really interesting, which was uh, um, because, it, because it talked about how we communicate, how we discuss um, stuff among ourselves in seminars, how we treat juniors, <laughs> um, and that may be relevant for the job market as well. Nisi Gunnar is now at the SEMFI in Madrid. Um, before that, he, um, and since his PhD in, uh, from Rochester in 2000, he has been at many different faculties. So he may know about the hiring culture and the job market culture in many different institutions, which may be very re relevant for today. Paola Pinotti, um, who is also from the Bocconi University, um, he finished his PhD in 2009 at Pompeo Fabra and was in between a couple of years at the Bank of Italy, which is something that he told me that he would bring into this dis in discussion, this double view of public uh, institution um, or central bank and uh, academics. Chris Roth is, uh, is one who, more, who takes more the view of someone who has been on the job market recently because he got his PhD from Oxford in 2018. So he, he is much more on the side of people who uh, want to go to the job market during the um, um, coming couple of years like the majority of our participants are. Um, and that is what we would expect him to cover. So how do we continue? Um, doing this panel as a webinar is new for us as well. So we have decided that only the panelists have video and audio. Please do still ensure that your name um, appears as your full name in the, in the list of participants. That would be just nice if, um, if I need to write a chat message to you. Um, you can switch between a speaker and a gallery view to, um, to see some slides, if there are any slides, um, and to have all the speakers, if you go to the gallery view, or only the one speaker who currently has his microphone on, uh, if you go to the speaker view. If you have any sort of questions, I would ask you to use the Q&A session or the Q&A section of Zoom. Um, and there you will also see questions by other participants, which you can then upvote. Um, the most common questions I see there will be put to the panel. And there are basically two options. Um, either I will call the question for you, or um, you can do that yourself. I'll write you a private chat message uh, to ask you if you, want to, if you want to ask the question yourself. Um, and if you raise your hand, I'll also follow up with a private chat message to, to ask you what, the, uh, what your problem may be. The golden rule, like always, is just please be polite and respectful. So what are we going to do today? What are we going to cover? Um, we have four large topics today. The first one is, is the job market adequate for me now? The second one, how to make your job market experience a success the third one, the three stages of the job market. So how is it organized? And the last uh, topic is a list of do's and don'ts during your job market. Um, each of those larger topics will be covered by some sort of a um, input talk by one of our panelists. And then afterwards, the panelists will discuss among themselves uh, and give additional insights. In the end, we'll have a large Q&A session. And if there is if there's something super important in between, I will also uh, call in a question in between. So without much further ado, I'll give over to Anna to discuss the Q&A and the insights we get from that, uh, or the polling and the insights we get from that, and uh, start off with the panel. Thank you, Gregor, for the nice introduction. So. I think for many young economists, the question, do you go on the market this year? For many, yeah, this question makes their pulse go, go crazy. And this is not only because dating is in some extent similar to going on the job market because it's about a good match. 
to find a good match. And so although there have been many textbooks written about the question how you survive, you can survive the academic job market, we have chosen to redo this panel because across Europe, um, it really matters a lot in which institution you are based, how well you are prepared to go on the market. And so to start with, I will pass over the word to Eliana, who um, prepared a little bit of the introduction to, on the question, is the job market adequate for me now? And maybe yeah, to have a little bit of a personal insight into your uh, job market experience, I would like to ask with um, yeah, to start with a, a little bit more informal question, because we have seen in your CV that you are also kind of a professional piano player. And so to start with, what do you think um, when you think back to your own job market experience, which composer um, would, would, would make the music for your own job market experience? So uh, this is one of those cases where my CV uh, <laughs> maybe doesn't highlight the most relevant features first because my piano playing abilities were not, um, you know, fantastic, let's put it that way. And second, because despite being trained at Harvard, I didn't go on a fully fledged job market. I had decided for personal reasons to come back to Italy. Uh, and so um, I did a very limited search, uh, which means maybe the music would be something like uh, Casta Diva from Bellini, uh, Norma. Uh, anyway, no, let me uh, try and be a little bit more serious about this. And I think the, the question of whether should I go on the job market, should I go now, uh, has two sides. One is any year you ask uh, this question, you know, it's uh, whether you should wait, maybe you are in your fifth year, you're wondering whether to wait for an extra year or not. So this is independent of the COVID situ situation and it's a question that students ask uh, all the time. Uh, so for that part, what I would say is, uh, um, you know, the standards uh, now to get good jobs are keep increasing. So a lot of people come in with uh, several uh, finished papers, not just their job market. It used to be the case that with the job market and a couple of abstracts, uh, you could go quite far. Now people, if they don't have real publications, they might have anyway working papers and so on. So I would advise to go when you have at least uh, a couple of drafts that are good, uh, and uh, if not a little bit more, you want to show a pipeline, you want to show a research agenda. I would say fifth or sixth year doesn't really make uh, any difference in the eye of the recruiters. Seven starts being uh, a little, a lot. I mean, in that case, uh, either you justify because you've done uh, some really, uh, you know, demanding um, data collection, uh, original data collection or experiment that took long. But uh, um, I would advise against waiting until the seventh year unless you have very clear reasons for that. The other part is what about this year because uh, of the fact that uh, many, many places are not hiring. Now, um, here I think we need to uh, be a little. Um, realistic and uh, expect that this hiring freeze might not just be a one-time thing. I, people I've talked to expect this to be a situation that may last for a couple of years, not one, okay? So in that case, you're not postponing by one year. Do you want to postpone by two years? And then what, three cohorts go on the market at the same time? Honestly, I'm not sure this is the best strategy. And I also start receiving uh, emails from colleagues that say, we're actually hiring, we have one position. So if you have students, do encourage them to apply. So I think recruiters are a little bit afraid that candidates might just, might just assume that there are no jobs while, you know, several places are hiring, certainly less than in the past, but there are jobs. Mm -hmm. So my uh, advice would be if you were planning to go, if you're ready, if you have your package ready and uh, you know, you're at a good stage, just go, okay? Um, ideally, you don't want to go two years in a row. So I would go, if you're ready this year, go this year, apply at the, to a broad range of jobs, not just assistant professorships, uh, apply to many postdocs, apply maybe to jobs in uh, 
um, other research institutions. I think Paolo can talk a little bit about central banks later and we can have this general discussion. So cast a wide net and, um, and then do it with enthusiasm and believing in it. And hopefully some things will move. I'm not sure that just retreating to you know, inaction would be the best thing for your career. But again, I'm very happy to hear uh, the dissenting opinions and have a discussion on this. Thank you, Eliana. Are there, I, is there some panelists who want to add something or sees it in a different way than Eliana? So I, I could add from my own personal experience that uh, postdocs are an amazing opportunity and that uh, from that perspective, uh, postdocs should, you know, you shouldn't, when you're a candidate, you shouldn't look down on postdocs. I mean, postdocs are in many ways uh, very liberating because you have more research time, res less responsibilities, less, less administrative responsibilities. And, and, you know, basically you have an option value to go on the market again in a couple of years later and so on. And given the current market situation, I would, I would, you know, I think it's a good strategy to be have, would, to have the expectation of being happy about getting a good postdoc position, um, you know, with the upside of potentially getting a tenure track position. And I think that's that's a little bit undervalued. I think the 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 market for postdocs could even become, you know, I mean, could be changing a little bit as well in response to the COVID crisis because some departments might have some short term needs for teaching and you know there might there might be even some structural changes in terms of the types of positions out there and there could be a bit of substitution of tenure track with postdoc in the short run so i, I would expect you know i would look at that market very carefully okay so well, there seems you know. to be hope except of COVID. <laughs> so navy you want to add something uh paolo do you want to go ahead oh yeah it was just to reiterate what they were saying about uh, the demand for postdoc, which I think it can be more, uh, uh, I mean, resistant to the crisis, uh, more uh, resilient compared to tenure mm -hmm. track positions, because, you know, uh, people that got a grant uh, one, two years ago, ERC grants or other type of grants, they would still need uh, researchers to work with them. And, and sometimes these are good opportunities. And the other thing that Eliana mentioned was, uh, and even Anna uh, mentioned was positions in policy institutions, right? Uh, so, uh, yeah, as they mentioned, I started to work in the central bank uh, in my first uh, at my first job. Actually, when I was second or maybe, yeah second year PhD, uh, I wanted to come back to Italy for, for personal reasons. So I, I started at the Bank of Italy, and actually, you know, these type of institutions every year they 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 hire several candidates and I, I think in this respect this year is not going to be different than any other year and the same is true for uh, other central bank and other public institutions so think about uh, national statistical institutes i mean uh, when you get there some of these places they have research department and they have tons of data of course what i'm saying now is probably more appealing to empirical researchers as i am okay so if you are some guy working in theory maybe thinking about going to the National Statistical Institute is not really your first choice, right? But for empirical uh, researchers, I mean, as Chris uh, said about postdoc, you shouldn't really look down on these positions. I mean, in general, and particularly this year. So we have a question that seems to be important for our audience, con con connected to um, the first point. That is, um, how much do you think will going on the market twice be punished or judged under the given COVID situation? So, um, does someone I of you I, want? I think we will move to a new culture here. I mean, that's my expectation. As the as Chris uh, said, uh, I think we are. Uh, going to experience a structural change where the postdocs are going to be more common. It's going to be both uh, a demand side and a supply side. I think this is great for uh, young economists to start uh, with, a, with a period where you can focus on research. And on the demand side, uh, I think both the financial constraints and the maybe increasing teaching needs uh, will uh, increase the demand. And as a result, I think it will be, uh, it will be much more acceptable uh, going to market uh, market a couple of times, so I, I, don't, I don't see. I think I think we are going through a structural 
structural change in that sense. Also, uh, going on the continuing on the postdoc issue, uh, my feeling is that in uh, in coming years, uh, when people consider different departments, they look at different departments. One feature that they will look at is okay, how uh, nurturing this place for our postdocs. I mean, I think there will be departments where you know uh, postdocs grow and get uh, better jobs, and this will be a kind of a defining uh, characteristics of uh, economic departments in in coming years, which is currently uh, we are not there. I think this is much more common in other sciences. And I think we are, maybe we won't go all the way there, but I think uh, in coming years, I expect, uh, to, you know, for uh, providing a good environment for postdoc will be a defining feature of good departments. Okay. Sorry, okay. I just want to uh, clarify. When I said you don't want to go twice, I didn't mean it in the sense that there's stigma. Um, it, it's more because of how taxing it is in terms of your time. There, you basically stop doing anything else from uh, now until mid-February or March. And then it's exhausting, it's costly also financially. So um, it's something that uh, if you can avoid doing it back to back, um, it's helpful because then you gain some time and some energy to do research. Uh, but mm -hmm. as Mezi said, I don't think people, especially this year, would be surprised if you know if you need to go a second time to find a good match it's more for your own uh, time allocation okay thank you very much eliana so uh, this was a really nice first round because of our time restrictions i think we should move on because we have a lot of ground to cover so um, i would give the i would uh, give the word to paolo who will start speaking about how to make your job market experience a success and um, he will give us some insights about the main issues when with respect to the timeline eliana already mentioned it so if you want to go on market now you will be occupied until february so uh, paolo this is the perfect uh, start for you i think to start um yeah uh, to go on to the next point yeah so um uh, let me give you a let's say if you want maybe official and a bit trivial answer about the timing of the job market and then maybe a, a, a longer answer. So the trivial answer, I mean, you know, the job market happens between the fall and the winter, right? So you send your application, typically deadlines are in November or December, a bit earlier in the US, a bit later in Europe. And uh, so the good thing would be to have your job market paper and possibly other papers ready for your letter writers to, to read them in, in, in the spring or at most during the summer, okay, the latest during the summer. Uh, and then you prepare your package uh, and then, you know, I mean, there are going to be interviews and then the flyouts in the spring. Okay, so I mean, I guess most of the people that I suppose that most of the people that attend this session and that are planning to go soon on the job market, they know more or less about this timeline. So uh, the more, uh, let's say, elaborate answer, which is probably again more relevant this year due to the COVID, uh, I think that the job market is always okay. So. I think up to now, the, the economics profession was a bit of peculiar compared to other disciplines, even compared to other social sciences, in the sense that we have a big job market for mostly tenure track positions concentrated in, in January or February, okay? Uh, in other disciplines, it's not like this. I mean, people hire more on a, on a rolling basis throughout the year, okay? So you can create uh, your own opportunities for, for a job market match uh, every time you go for a seminar or every time you attend a conference or every time you visit another department, every time you attend, you know, a, a speaker seminar at your department, okay? Uh, because some of these people may be interested in, you know, they may be searching for people for postdoc position, or they may pick, I mean, if they are powerful inside their department, let's put it like this, they may consider opening some positions in case they have a decent number of candidates that they are interested to, okay? So because of what we were saying before, I think this type of rolling uh, job market is, is going to be uh, more and more relevant this year and, and the following year. Okay, so 
because of this, of course, focus on the, let's say, the, the official job market or the standard job market timeline, but be prepared every time uh, you have the opportunity of talking to uh, some faculty or talking to some guy that is doing interesting work for you to, you know, attend the seminar or maybe ask if there's uh, the opportunity of, of presenting yourself in a seminar. Again, COVID uh, has good and bad, uh, you know, effects on this in the sense now it's, it's harder to get in touch with these people in person, but at the same time, there's an explosion of uh, uh, online seminar series in which you can easily reach uh, 100 people in just one afternoon by presenting online, okay? And I, I mean, again, this may also seem trivial, but uh, I'm quite surprised when, uh, for instance, even in my university or in other places, uh, there are seminars, uh, you know, uh, big guys or big guys or, or not big guys, whatever, interesting work being presented and the PhD students, they are not there, okay? So it, it's one hour of your time and signing up for a slot and talking to these people is an additional 20 minutes. I mean, you're the, the first ones that should go, okay? Because in this way, I mean, you learn something and you may also get other people to know you, okay? And, and this is, uh, I think this is extremely important. And finally, just another thing. <laughs> In addition to attending all, I mean, taking all these chances to uh, get yourself known, also look at uh, job positions that uh, are posted every week. Okay, again, there's a, let's say, a big job market in, in, the, in the fall, in the winter, but some positions get advertised in the spring because somebody gets, uh, I mean, needs a, a postdoc or a central bank is hiring or another public institution is hiring. So uh, just get used to check once per week or once uh, every two weeks, the, this type of positions. Okay, so um, as Paolo just mentioned, the world becomes more flexible. Uh, this seems also to be true for the job market. So, okay, even if everything gets more flexible, we need a package, okay? You need a package to be ready to go because without a package, also the more flexible market is not helping you. And um, what are the key elements to pack into this package? Nezi, would you like to start, um, yeah, to give us some insights sure. about the key elements of this package? Well, I mean, obviously the most important element of the package is the job market papers. I mean, that cannot be uh, stressed enough. Uh, as uh, Eliana mentioned, uh, there has been a shift uh, in the profession uh, in our time. Uh, I think we are more or less from the same generation. It was very typical to go in the market in the fifth year. It was not unheard of going on the fourth year. Now it's much more common to go in the sixth year. But what happened is that, you know, that extra year uh, rather than, you know, oh, let me you know, postpone uh, preparing a job market paper. I think people, most of the people in uh, well-run PhD institutions, uh, they prepare the job market paper is ready in the fifth year, but then gets this extra year of polishing and being presented and getting comments. So I think having a polished uh, job market paper is important. Uh, it's, uh, I think it's very damaging to have a job market paper where uh, you see typos in the introduction, there are uh, sections missing, uh, you know, question marks here and there, tables are not uh, well positioned. I think uh, because you have to imagine, you know, we are recruiters, uh, we are going over, you know, hundreds and hundreds of files. So it's, uh, you know, the professionality of the, you know, the job market and other paper how they look like how they read the introduction abstract i mean this is this is very important and and for that i think as paula uh, paula already indicated it's important to have it uh, ready early on and and get it polished another um, maybe uh, i i want to answer uh, to to uh, to pose an additional question here so what would you propose how often should you present a job market paper and who should read the job market paper before you have a feeling that it is ready Wow. Okay. So this is, I mean, at the end of the day, this is pretty much between you and your advisor. Again, different PhD programs have different styles. I come from a PhD uh, program and I, as an advisor, I have a very much of a hand-on style. So I think uh, 
for me, whenever your uh, advisor or your PhD committee says that you can, uh, you are ready, you are ready. <laughs> so I think uh, I, I would say, uh, the, you know, the summer of, uh, you know, suppose you're going to job market uh, in the fall, uh, the summer before is a good time to present because you still can get comments and uh, integrate them and improve the paper and people have uh, you your paper fresh in mind. Uh, presenting a very early versions I think is great in-house but uh, may not be great uh, doing outside. I think once you start going outside I think you should have a polished uh, product uh, that you can uh, define uh, defend your turf. I think that's uh, important. The, the summer before the job market is a critical time to present. So but that means you know of course you need that means you need a kind of a draft uh, almost a year before so that's why i'm saying that year that extra year somehow uh, push the job market papers to be uh, very polished in the in the current situation uh, and then another thing in the package is that uh, one has to be careful about the quality quantity trade-off i mean in the sense that people are somehow it, I mean, some students uh, want to put you know many work in progresses uh, working papers that are in uh, not so good shape i mean whatever you put there you are reliable you are liable so if you say i have a working progress that means that's a project that you can you should be able to have a very meaningful conversation about it with a, with a potential recruiter so i would be very careful about you know just simply if inflating things and uh, that things that are not uh, that are not ready about of course the letters are important and there again uh, many students might think okay it's very important to have uh, letters from famous people no i mean letters have to be informative i mean that's the that's what you, again we, as a recruiters what you are looking for is differentiate between candidates an uninformative letter from a famous person is not very very valuable whereas uh, an informative uh, letter from someone that uh, you know you don't know that well you will take it uh, much more seriously so i think uh, the package uh, professionality of the package is important and these things takes time that's also uh, that's also important to emphasize in our time it was you know you prepare hundred envelopes you go to the post office and uh, you just shuffled them they were all identical now this thing every university has an online system uh, everything takes time so that shouldn't also be uh, shouldn't be also underestimated so let me stop here uh, in case others want to uh, add uh, <laughs> Yeah, it, the stage is yours. So we get some, I think, so our crowd, 80% um, of our crowd joining our Zoom are early PhD candidates. So I think your, your, comment, uh, your, your advice is very valuable to them. So how can a young PhD student recognize a good letter? Yeah, so how, how can you get a feeling for a good letter? What is a good letter? What is not? not such a great letter. So a good letter is a letter that shows that uh, um, you have the creativity and the skills to produce uh, top research. Okay, so that's why the person needs to know you well because they need to be confident when they make these statements. And uh, um, a letter that says that you work very hard, um, you know, is not going to take you super far. So uh, that you know, work with your advisor to make sure that they understand uh, that you care and you're passionate about uh, what you do research on, because they need to convey also that type of signal. And uh, one thing to add to what Nezi was saying, which I uh, completely agree on, uh, in terms of uh, you know who to to discuss your job market paper with uh, and to. The advisor is clearly going to be the one more invested and uh, who will put most time in reading it. But uh, I would say the most crucial uh, thing in a successful job market is to pitch your paper so that everybody will get excited, not only people in your field. This is very important, for example, when you do the interview and you need to get to the stage of a flyout. There you really have maybe 10 minutes to convince about your job market paper and people who are from all sorts of fields. And, uh, and the pitch of the same message, you could have the identical results, the identical model, the identical tables, and one makes it look like, wow, this is, how could I not think that this was something to, so important to research? And the other would say, yes, yes, well done. So there's a, such a wedge between these two with the same background. 
uh, that I think it pays a lot to learn how to market your results. And for this, maybe your advisor is not the person, maybe your advisor has the most awesome knowledge about the topic, but uh, is less good a marketer than someone else. And then I would say, go talk to this other person. If they are in your PhD program, you, you can say, I'm a student in this program. You know, can I check my spiel with you? Can I check uh, for two minutes, three minutes, if what I say about my research convinces you? And, uh, and do it. I, I think we are happy as a profession to help our students uh, um, improve what they do. And some places have it as a standard because they're very professional in the way they train applicants. Other places maybe have started only recently sending people on the international market. So be proactive and ask, uh, can I do a mock interview with you? And so just get many uh, and ask people to read your interview, your introduction, not your whole paper. Okay, if it's not uh, your committee, you go to a random professor, they cannot read your whole paper. But people can read your introduction and say, I, I didn't really find it so logical. So that's really one of the most important things to work on in my opinion. My audio is off. So, okay, I would suggest because we are already running a bit short on time <laughs> that we move on. So imagine we have a package ready. Yeah, it's the right time to go on the market. So there are the three stages of the job market and each stage has its specific, yeah, its specific things to um, think about. And um, Eliana, would you start to talk a little bit about applications? So. Where should I apply? Because there seem to be different strategies around. Yeah, when you when when you when you talk to 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 advisors or also to to people who have done the job market, like like Chris, for example. So some people they tell you just send out as many applications as you can, and others say, ah, oh, look for good fits. Yeah, think about which institution fits fits me and which would be a good match and here there seems to be some confusion around and we would be happy to hear your opinion on that <clears throat> so my opinion is um, I think a combination in the middle meaning that the good fit comes in when you pick your job once you have the offers uh, at the initially you don't know how many offers you're gonna have and where okay so I think you want, to send, you want to send many applications, but you don't want to waste people's time. So you should never apply to a place where you have no intention of going, okay? So if, there, if I know that I'm not going to go outside Europe, don't send you know, CVs to Asia, to North America, or even within Europe, just send to places where if you do not have a dominant offer, you would take. Okay. But there are some people who apply and then say, you know what, I'd rather stay one more year with some uh, research contract in my universities than go there, then that application should not be sent. to them. Okay. Um, Chris, for example, you recently survived the job market. Yeah, so how did you do that, your application? Exactly. I mean, I, I think I went uh, for uh, the, the kind of middle ground approach. I mean, in the sense that, you know, the marginal cost of an application is super low. So in some sense, um, you know, it makes sense to apply to many places. And there's a lot of uncertainty that one even has about where one wants to go. So it, it does make, you know, if there's a lot of uncertainty about where you want to go and you're open to going, you know, I guess, you know, to the US and Europe, it's easily possible to send out you know, in a normal year, it would have been easily possible to send out between 100 and 150 applications. But I also completely agree with Eliana that if, um, if you know you don't want to go to Australia, then don't uh, apply to the Australian uh, research uh, schools. Uh, and so, I mean, yeah, I mean, my, and, I mean my, my impression is that the marginal cost is very low with these applications and that it does make sense to explore because we really, you really don't know a place until you've visited, you know, talked to them, visited them. I mean, there are many surprises. There are many excellent researchers at, you know, at places doing research connected to yours that you didn't know about before the market. And so 
the market is also an opportunity to explore this and to kind of learn about other places and to you know get to know people that you can connect with and that you might want to work with and that you might yeah well want to join even though you didn't anticipate that beforehand hey perfect we have a question from the audience that fits very good, I think, at, at this point. So, because now we were talking about how many applications to send, but of course, there's also the question where to send my applications to. So, there are the two things the American market and the European market. But as we heard before, I think Nevi was mentioning it, there are other jobs that might be interesting. And so, our, our audience was very interested into that because people are puzzled where they can find additional jobs. Yeah, which are not purely academic. Yeah, so can you recommend platforms? This is the, the yeah. So where can we check for jobs that are not offered via the centralized job market? Yeah, non-academic and academic. So this is a question that um, is very on top of our question list. And second, the question a bit. So when I have to decide, is the American market interesting for me, or shall I rather stay in Europe? Um, what is your opinion on that? Um, Chris, so, so, first. So I, um, I mean, so I, I want first say, I think for finding um, different types of um, job ads, I think Twitter is useful. I mean, like, like many other things, you know, of course you need to use it in the right possible way and the right way. But um, in principle, I think there you learn a lot about potential job ads that are not, you know, marketed on a centralized platform. Um, and then I guess, yeah, I think it's all about, inf I mean, as Paolo was saying, it's all a bit about um, informal contacts. If you happen to know someone at a given institution, just email them whether there's any informal, uh, you know, whether, there's a, whether they know anything informally about positions out there. So I guess it's all, again, about the outreach. Sending an email to ask someone uh, a question whether they know of any positions that might be out there at policy institutions and so on is not costly at all and you know people might not respond but if it takes you 10 minutes to write the message then that that was good return on investment from from that perspective yeah on sorry go, go ahead, ahead <laughs> so so okay <laughs> so basically what you can uh, one thing is that you can use the network of uh, the alumni of your institution i mean you, you should always pay attention where the graduates of your institutions are currently working and keep an eye on that and you have to keep in mind that you know uh, people want to hire good people so as chris said you know it's uh, not very costly to send these emails and don't be shy i mean everybody wants to find uh, good uh, uh, good, uh, good candidate. So I think this is. Uh, so I would. You have to be uh, proactive and use uh, all the, all the all the possible resources. Sorry, Paolo. No, no. I I, I totally agree with what you say and what uh, with what Chris said. Uh, another website which is very easy is Inomics, uh, and I think they post. So for instance, for some reason, I. I uh, typically, uh, jobs uh, from Germany are advertised a lot there, I, I notice, also from Spain. And then, I don't know if you have an interest in going to some particular country, which may be your country, another country, you, you can get a bit specialized in that. So, as I mentioned, I wanted to go back to Italy. In Italy, there's an official list, the Gazzetta Ufficiale, of all public positions. So there you get advertisement for position at the central bank or at some other economic policy institution, National Statistical Institute. And I guess in other countries, there are similar things. Uh, and then the other thing is check uh, the, the usual website like uh, Econ Job Market and uh, Joe uh, throughout the year, because it's true that most uh, uh, advertisement, uh, you know, they pop up uh, after the summer, but I mean, th there are uh, uh, jobs that are advertised even in the spring. It's just that I guess the traffic on these websites in the spring, it, it's basically uh, zero, but, but there are some positions that are advertised uh, there. And Twitter, Twitter works a lot for this. Yeah. Okay. Um, any more comments on, on this? If not, um, we, we could move to interviews because 
find it. Not everyone gets interviews. Some people get many interviews. And um, as we heard in the last edition of this panel, these interviews, they can be very stressful. Yeah. And um, so how do you prepare for interviews? Because there are a lot of rumors around people get super nervous. And uh, how can you prepare to, yeah, to do a good job during the interviews? What, what can you recommend here? And I think we start with Chris or Eliana. Okay, I, I, I can I can go ahead, but uh, I mean, so I guess the, the well, I guess it, it all really comes back to things that Eliana said earlier when talking and, and, and the others said earlier about the whole preparation of the market. I mean, in the end, the interview is all about you being able to confidently present your job market idea and paper in a to a general audience such that everyone in the room understands it and can get excited about it. And my biggest piece of advice is when you go on the market, you know, practice a lot with the other people that you know who are on the market. So back when I was on the market, I had a great group of friends that I basically could practice with. And we, you know, we practiced a lot. And by a lot, I really mean a lot in the sense that, you know, you practice with, with different people, you know, 20, you know, 20, 30 times that, you know, short, you know, five minute spiel, but, you know, the returns to that are large. And the other thing that I really think is important is don't only practice with people in your field, practice with people from other fields. You know, I'm, I mean, I guess we would behavioral and experimental, but, you know, I would want to give my talk to like a macro person or like an econometrician, basically, you know, do they understand uh, what's going on? Do they understand why this is interesting? And so I think that, that is the one thing. The other thing, it's, it's a very kind of generic and big picture kind of advice, but you know, the job market is very stressful, both mentally and physically. So I, I, I was surprised how physically exhausting it was. So I recommend people to exercise and to kind of, you know, invest a lot, both in their physical and mental health, you know, be it through things like meditation or, you know, running and so on. But I think the returns to that are large because you are more sharp when your mind is clear and when you're happy. Um, and, uh, you know, the, especially in Corona times, this might be particularly important. Uh, so this kind of... Maybe I jump in directly here because Corona is also puzzling a lot um, our crowd. And um, so one, uh, one participant uh, in our panel or in our Zoom meeting is wondering if there will be no visiting this year because of Corona and it's difficult to travel to go and visit places. Yeah. Um, how could we try to substitute that? Because there will be no real interviews maybe. And then you don't get to know the people. It's, it's a different thing. And um, so how should you, do you have some advice how to prepare for that? So, so let, let me come in here. I think we should, separate visiting the city to you know, see the place. This may be possible in some countries, not in others, we don't know, it's all in flux. And uh, you know, if you cannot go, you'll have to find people who are there, maybe through alumni or friends or networks and get a feel a little bit, but um, you know, there's not much we can do about it. As for everything else, uh, whether or not interviews are in person, I think, uh, um, the substance will not be completely different, okay? There are going to be some features, for example, uh, make sure if you do something online or through video to look professional, have a background that is okay and whatever it is, which was not the case before. Um, but uh, other things on the substance of what you say are still there, okay? So if people are still scheduling a total of 30 minutes for you, it's still true that the way you start your interview and what you say is going to be very similar, if not exactly the same as before. And here I wanted to say a couple of things. Again, for those who don't have, um, you know, institutions that are very um, experienced with this type of training. So what you want to do when you prepare your interview is to structure it in blocks. The first block is two to three minutes. And in this block, you just start by thanking people for um, you know, giving you the opportunities to share your research with them. You say your name, you say, I work in this field and my job market paper is, okay? And uh, my paper, 
asks a question of, uh, so within two, three minutes, you just give a three line summary of what your paper is about. And then typically they will not interrupt you. And you say, now let me go more in detail into the methodology and the results. And you have an extra 10 minutes to explain your paper. And in those 10 minutes, you might get interrupted, but those 10 minutes really need to, uh, they, they are the equivalent of the introduction of the paper when you read it. They need to contain everything that people would want to know, the essentials, and they need to be understandable uh, by everybody uh, who's not in your field. So this part of uh, three plus 10 is I think what Chris meant, uh, you need to practice a lot. You need to get it just right and try it many, many times. I advise people, I, I don't do it in my talks now because I'm, I think, uh, you know, out of control with time management, but I hear people um, uh, who advise to write down things. Even if you give long speeches, some people, you will be surprised, but they write down every single word because you need to get it exactly right. Of course, you don't want to sound like you're memorizing and repeating. Uh, you need to make it natural, but uh, uh, you don't want to be put off by the fact that the right word is not coming. So just be absolutely, um, you know, uh, just be a maniac when it comes to those three plus 10 minutes. And then the rest of the interview, I think, uh, be prepared to answer questions like what you would like to teach. Uh, and here you want to show some balance between the availability to, to teach uh, general, uh, you know, kind of uh, first year courses or whatever, but uh, in, uh, so you say I can teach micro at the undergraduate level, but also show that you would like to teach at the graduate level in your field, uh, because this gives you more engagement with uh, researchers and young researchers in the university. Uh, be prepared to ask questions like, uh, how did you get your idea for the job market paper? This is where people try to understand how creative you are and how this came about. Uh, questions like, uh, um, why do you want to work here? Why did you apply to our university? Uh, show that you've done your job and your research in uh, knowing who's at the place, uh, what seminars they are. So prepare questions. Very often the interview ends with, do you have questions for us? And, uh, um, and there you want to have some questions that are uh, hopefully kind of specific to that university. So I saw you had this seminar series, but uh, I was also interested in something else and so on. So if you have many, many interviews, uh, of course, you cannot remember every panel uh, and you will take notes, but uh, please do an effort before entering the interview to refresh your memory and uh, make it as natural as possible. It happens sometimes that candidates uh, open the book and say, oh, let me see what I had for you, which is totally understandable because, you know, I wouldn't remember if I had uh, 25 interviews. But again, uh, um, you know, if, the, if, if you are the place where they want to go, they should remember. So a lot of what the interviewer is trying to elicit is if you're good enough, but also if they have a chance of getting you when they make you an offer. So in the interview, uh, if they see that you're detached or not so interested, you might be a superstar, but you will not get the fly out. So uh, make sure to convey that uh, signal that uh, you are uh, super good, but you also like their place very much, if that's true otherwise. Okay, I think I should shut yeah. up. We are a bit running out of time, but one question that came up and seems to be important for many people is, okay, um, the chance to have a successful interview seems to depend a lot on the institution where you're coming from. So in Europe, there are not so many famous institutions. So the question is a bit, what can you do to, yeah, to increase a bit your chances to get a chance, yeah, to, to receive interviews, even though you're not coming from a top university? Nezi, or Paolo, Paolo goes first. We always go together, Nezi, for some reason. <laughs> Um, but no, I, I, I just repeat myself, sorry about that. But uh, if you come from a not so well-known place, just try to build up your chances of 
get known, okay? And this means uh, giving seminars whenever you can and going to talk to people whenever you can, okay? So, I mean, I, I think it, it's true, unfortunately. I'm not saying anything new by saying that, of course, if when you evaluate people just based on, you know, uh, the institution they come from, uh, you know, not so well-known institutions are ranked below a better known institution, okay? I mean, it is just trivial. But once you get in touch to people and you speak with them for just five minutes, it can dramatically change the perception uh, you have about, uh, about students, okay? Um, and candidates. So I think this is very important. Okay. Yeah, and so I think I have to be a bit un impolite because we have 15 minutes left. And I would say that we should talk a bit about fly out because fly or yeah, this is a um, yeah one step that is which is missing um, for the job market experience. And Nezi, maybe you go ahead and start with flyouts and how to prepare for flyouts, how to handle flyouts well, um, and things you should yeah sure. not do maybe during flyouts. <laughs> uh, well, one thing I want to emphasize is that you know as uh, already been indicated, uh, you know uh, there is big uh, variation how institutions prepare their students for interviews or flyouts, and the returns are huge. So if you're, a, if you're a student in an institution where there's not a strong tradition of preparing students, be proactive. There's lots of material online, how to do these things, and you can come together with a couple students, pressure your program. I mean, the returns are uh, uh, huge and cannot be underestimated. So I encourage uh, students who feel like, you know, uh, maybe they need better preparation, be proactive and, uh, and uh, obtain the training uh, training they, they need. Now, when it comes to the fly out, of course, it's a different uh, level. Uh, one thing I always tell to uh, my students is that, you know, uh, the institutions are not trying to hire a graduate student. They're trying to hire an assistant professor. So, so this the fly out is a, po is, a, is a point where you have to show that you are able and willing to do the transition from being a student to being a uh, faculty. What does that mean? That means uh, the ability to talk with uh, peoples from, people from different fields, uh, which is uh, you have to show that uh, you can engage people. Are, people are trying to hire a next door colleague. Uh, so that's what they want. Uh, they want someone who is engaging, who can talk not just about his or her paper, but uh, broadly about economics. I think having a broad view and, uh, and remembering that, you know, they are trying to hire an assistant professor is uh, very important. A second uh, advice I typically give my students is that, you know, uh, we spend a lot of time writing our job market papers. Sometimes you spend your two years cracking a code or, you know, uh, entering the data. Uh, I mean, those things uh, people don't necessarily pay attention to. So the things that, uh, you know, cost you a lot of time might not be the things that, you know, for make people exciting. So going back to Adriana's comment, uh, finding the right uh, selling, selling uh, uh, spiel is uh, very important. Don't get, uh, you know, uh, talk with, uh, you know, what you want to tell about your job market paper with people who are not necessarily in your field with your, with your other uh, fellow students and find the right balance. And you have to show basically maturity, uh, forward-looking uh, behaviors, uh, not backward-looking, also forward-looking about future ideas, you have to be engaging in the flyout with uh, uh, people you are meeting, what they are doing. Uh, and uh, it's, again, you have to show that you are ready to start as an assistant professor. That's my short input for flyout stage. Okay, I think who wants to add something about flyouts? So, for example, how to behave when you go to dinner or to lunch and how to prepare for such a day um, of a flyout? I mean, I guess it's it's really helps if you know stuff. I mean, if you know about the well faculty's research, because you will end up talking, uh, you know, also about random things, or you'll talk to them about their research and so on. And it just helps to understand a little bit what the backgrounds of those people are. So I think for the flyout stage, it definitely makes sense to think very carefully about what kind of research, uh, you know, the faculty members, the place that you're visiting is exactly conducting, what kinds of methods they are using. And to, you know, that, that really helps, I think, with one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one conversations. And of course, it's a great signal if you can show that, you know, um, 
you know, you know, the faculty members research because I mean, as Nizi said, I mean, in the end, they are trying to hire um, a colleague that they can talk to and that they can get advice, uh, you know, from regarding research and that they can call it collaborate with and so on. So I think there I would really strongly advise investing a lot. As for all of the other things, I mean, like dinners and lunches and these casual side conversation, again, I mean, it all comes down to the, the point, um, you know, you want all of this to be friendly, just like, uh, uh, like, because, you know, people need to like you <laughs> in order to hire you. And so, you know, if you're, you know, if you're nice and you can have nice fun conversations um, that are also not about economics at dinner I think you know that that probably helps although I think you know that's probably not the crucial point but I think in general um, it's it's just a good good sign if you can have uh, normal conversations not necessarily even about uh, economics. So I think, um, many parts of um, flyouts are, will be different this year and um, we get many questions in the Q&A yeah, if you could tell us something about if you know how your institutions, for example, will handle this online situation. So if there will be online situations, for example, what will be special about, for example, flyouts? Because there won't be real flyouts. So do you have any comments and ideas to share? share? Eliana, maybe you can also do an advertisement for um, the session that will explain a bit more in detail how the European job market will work this year. Yeah. Sure, so the, the EEA has um, discussed, uh, you know, in the past uh, months and weeks, uh, um, the situation of the market. Uh, there is a committee that's, um, you know, in charge of this. And uh, there will be a statement uh, with um, information details and so on uh, that will be officially released on Thursday. So uh, two days from now at 1.45 p.m. So it's during the Congress. I think you should find it listed in the program of the Congress. Uh, and I encourage you to, to log into that session. Um, and and uh, there, uh, hopefully, there would be enough information about how the European job market uh, uh, is going to be uh, handled. Now, more generally, uh, I, I'm not sure. I think many institutions will have to discuss now as activities resume how exactly to structure their hiring. So uh, I don't have personally any inside information or guidelines coming from Bocconi because we haven't yet met uh, um, to discuss this. But my hint would be if you've attended online seminars um, until now, um, a job talk, a virtual job talk uh, must be very close to an online seminar. So uh, think yourself about uh, what you think is working well and what is working less well during online seminar and fix it so that you can uh, handle it. For example, if you're giving a seminar, it's a little harder for people to um, uh, you know, ask questions uh, very casually because they need to interrupt you while you're talking and so on. So something that people are suggesting is maybe to announce that you will stop uh, so that you know you you will give a talk and uh, you will stop at some point during the talk um, to see if there are questions that relate to what you said up to that point. So in that case, you could start your regular seminar with maybe introduction and summary of the paper, and then uh, if you have the blocks on methodology, think about where it would be a good time to stop and say is. Uh, are there any questions about what I said so far and so on. So this is something that during a regular seminar you don't need to do, but maybe you will need to do during a talk if it's online. But other than that, I think the interviews might be, the, sorry, the schedule might be like face-to-face -face through monitor instead of in person. And um, yeah, the more natural and uh, you know, engaged you seem, the better. I, I'm not sure I know much more than this. 
Yeah, but I think I we all uh, make it as a first experience, have a first experience this year. Yeah, yeah, but I expect, I agree with that. Yeah, and I think the gist of the matter will be very similar. So I intend that there will be, you know, interviews and a presentation. Indeed, in the presentation, in contrast to, uh, uh, you know, physical presentation, I think the presenter will have a little bit more freedom to impose, to, to you know, set up the rules. I think uh, there will be, I think it will be uh, less stressful for many people. That's my expectation. Uh, so, because you will have, you know, uh, there will be uh, questions and answers will be more, uh, you know, paced. Uh, you can always repeat the question. Uh, you can ask them to repeat the question. I think the whole experience will be, in terms of the talk, will be less stressful. That's my expectation. Of course, you have to make sure your internet connection is well, because that's going to be maybe, a, you know, a new source of stress, which is uh, critical. But overall, overall uh, preparation strategy wouldn't be uh, different than uh, what we tell students in a normal year because you have to prepare for interviews you have to prepare for your talk okay so we have to prepare for the end of our time slot unfortunately last time it was 90 minutes this uh, was much longer so but today it's only 60 minutes and so to wrap up it would be great if each of of, of our panelists could just come up with a do and a don't yeah what to consider not to do and what to consider to do when preparing now for for the job market that would be great chris maybe you start as the survivor <laughs> <laughs> okay so i think the, the the do is definitely um be enthusiastic and passionate about your research and you know convey that to you know yeah a broad audience as much as possible and the don't would be you know don't don't be overly anxious especially in, in these difficult times when, you know, there's things that are just not as predictable and, and, and more uncertain. Perfect. Nezi? Well, I would say, you know, uh, uh, the preparation is key. So don't underestimate uh, the importance of preparation. So you have to put a uh, great uh, effort to that. That's a big do. Uh, and in terms of uh, don'ts, uh, you know, for, uh, don't be uh, defensive. Most of the time uh, when people ask you questions, they want to know better. Uh, so I would uh, you have to have a, you know, approach that, you know, if people are asking you questions, uh, sometimes that might sound aggressive. Most of the time they want to know what you're doing. Uh, you know, I would be more worried if nobody's asking questions. Uh, so I would uh, be, that's another uh, that's uh, on the don't part. Paolo? Yeah, as I said, get yourself known, approach people, and at the same time, among the don'ts, don't go there just saying, look, I'm super interested in your work, or I would like to do this and that. No, go there and say, okay, I'm doing this and using this data, and I want, I show you this, and this is my result. So three minutes, you get yourself known. And the other thing that is a don't, uh, don't think it's a life or death situation. So if I can be totally honest, I don't like so much this wording of the survivor things. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's an important moment of your career, but it's not the only one, okay? So it can go a bit better or a bit worse. There's some randomness, but sooner or later, everybody more or less converges to, to the right level, okay? So don't be too stressed about this. Eliana. It's a combination of all the details. No, I, I agree with most of these things. So to say something different that's not being said. One thing I would do is uh, um, spend enough time learning from other job candidates. Uh, visit the websites of uh, uh, you know, top departments in the US. Uh, uh, see how they prepare their CV, how they prepare their website. Uh, uh, all of that is very structured, very professional. And so there's a lot to learn. Uh, there are some people who have taken trouble to write down um, experiences and uh, advice. And uh, I know your association has a document, uh, BEA has a document in the job market session, section. And there are several people out there who have given advice on how to present, uh, what to do during the market. So look for those documents online and do your homework, try to learn. 
And uh, in the don't, uh, I think here I line up, uh, you know, most closely with Paolo. So try to think of the ultimate goal for why you've done a PhD and why you're into economics. And, um, and I think uh, just convey that. Don't, uh, don't try to be what you're not uh, during the process. And if things go as you expect, fine. If they don't go as you expect, there are some incredible stories of people who got underplaced by a lot in their first job and ended up uh, uh, with a brilliant career because they were driven by something else. So this placement that you're going to have, if it goes well, we're all happier. We all wish that for ourselves, but it's not what will determine if you are successful or not. It's your motivation and if you're under place you will just have to work harder going to conferences and meeting people and move on later on but it's not uh, the end of the you know the world. This is, an, this is a really nice positive um, yeah positive statement I think and um, so although we are a bit late I would give the floor to Gregor because we already uh, incorporate some of the Q&As, but um, maybe Gregor has some more and it would be great. Gregor is gone. This is not good. So <laughs> um, I will have a look into uh, the Q&As. So we have a question from Daniele. On, and he asks, which kind of information do recruiters expect to see in the cover letter in the research statement? And which is the relative importance of the two? So he didn't mention a specific person. So whoever um, has an answer to that or want, wants to comment would be great to hear your comments because it's upvoted in our voting list. So this is about the cover letter? Yes, exactly. I repeat. Which yeah. kind of information do recruiters expect to see in the cover letter and the research statement? Yeah. I mean, in the cover letter, I mean, Stating obvious would not help. I mean, in the sense that, you know, what you want to put in the cover letter, if there is some specific information you want to convey to that institution. Just, you know, just telling, you know, you are, you are, you are applying, here is uh, the short, uh, here is the summary of my research, etc. That's standard. So I think yeah, you would, I would stick to the standard if there is nothing special about that institution, but if there is something special about that institution, you really want to go for some personal reasons that you want to convey. So, I mean, beyond that, uh, I don't think there is much one can do. At least that's my, in the cover letter side, that's my uh, opinion. Okay, are there more um, comments on that or different perspectives? You were all agreeing on each other today, more or less. This, uh... So maybe in the cover letter, suppose that you have personal reasons to want to go to a certain place mm -hmm. related to your partner, let's say. What I would do in the cover letter would be to say, look, uh, uh, I'm strongly motivated to come uh, uh, to your university because of its research, uh, you know, excellence, blah, blah, blah. And I also, um, for also from a personal standpoint, I would be very happy to be in that city. Mm -hmm. Don't uh, write in the cover letter, my boyfriend or girlfriend or is there, but have your advisor convey that information to the people they know there and say, look, uh, Eliana is really keen to come there because her partner would have a job there. So these are things that uh, are best communicated through advisors. Uh, and um, and uh, in that case, it would help because then they know you're serious about this. And so in if the I... third statement, it's more about, uh, I think uh, people will see the list of papers in your CV in the research statement, you want to show that you had a plan. Sometimes you didn't uh, and you have to make it exposed. But uh, you want to show that there is some thread, some coherence in your thinking, and that uh, you want to say where you're going next or where you would like to go next. Okay, so you would say that it's difficult to, the relative importance of cover letter and research statement, it's, it's difficult also relatively what is more important the cover letter or the research statement where should you invest more when i found the research statement uh, more important because mm -hmm. cover letter is more of a standard thing i'm not sure if institutions pay much attention to it uh, i think the research statement is much more fundamental if it would be okay for you there is one more question that is upvoted by andrea pasqualini 
who ask, I find it difficult to find the right spot between pitching honestly, but convincingly and overselling my results as I cannot yeah, sell it this to, lit, to literally everybody. Do you have tips on this between overselling and honestly? How, how yeah, how to find a good middle, middle path there? I mean, I, I guess you know, there's no golden rule, but one thing that certainly helps is, uh, you know, like when you write your paper, the introduction of your journal market paper or any other paper, learn from the professionals, okay? So read how these, you know, uh, people that are, you know, very good researchers write down their introduction and this is gonna help you in, in doing it yourself for your job market paper. And I, I think once you have clear in mind what you have written in, in the paper, I mean, this is more or less the same way in which you, you should also communicate that uh, in person. Also, this is a dynamic process somehow, you know, in the sense that, uh, you know, of course, in an interview, you want to be excited and you know you want to sell as much as possible but if one of the interviewers uh, you know tells you look there is a problem with your identification here and the person obviously knows what uh, she's talking about you know you have to be very honest and you know get into discussion so this is not a, like you know there's one rule that uh, fits all i think you have to find a balance you have to be as much uh, possible as you know sell and excited but when it comes to you know uh, people ask uh, specific questions uh, you cannot uh, drop honesty that's what uh, we are in this profession for mm -hmm. so let me say i think it's not super difficult, I think, to see the difference between overselling and uh, being enthusiastic because overselling is with respect to facts. You cannot claim something that you haven't done. Mm -hmm. You cannot claim a contribution that's already done by someone else. So this, you should never make that mistake. This will piss off people and there is no need for that. But if you know that your contribution is limited to a certain um, range of findings or whatever, just think hard for why that is important and how you can convey the importance of it. Sometimes this requires work. So sometimes you need to think of examples that uh, your contribution helps solve, you know, situations, policy scenarios, whatever it is that others haven't done. And uh, it's not something, all I'm saying is that find a way to counteract potential criticism of, of why do I really learn so much from it and why should I care, okay? That's what I mean by pitch it well, not claim that you have done something that you haven't done, but take the most out of what you've done in terms of relevance, interest, and importance. Okay, thank you, Eliana, and thank you, Chris, Nezi, and Paolo. We are already five minutes past our deadline. So I think because Gregor has some technical problems and is dropping out, I take the opportunity in the name of um, Young Economist and our association to thank you for your time, um, to answer questions and to, yeah, to give us a, a, short, um, yeah, a short idea about yeah, what should we take seriously it's not the end of the world. I think this was an important message. And for everyone in the panel, what we will do is we will post a summary of the main main results or the main takeaways on our webpage. So um, if you're interested, yeah, check out our, our homepage, apply for our yeah, spring meeting. It's a good opportunity <laughs> to uh, train your job market paper. We had really good presentations of job market papers at the last spring meeting and uh, stay healthy. Um, yeah, thank you very much and thank you. Um, thank hope you. to see you soon, Thanks maybe in person. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Ah, Thanks. Back. <laughs> okay, we were around 200 people in, in, the, in the webinar. Yes. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. And advertisement for, um, I think, for this audience, it's super nice to go to participate in the session on Thursday on the EEA job market. There you will get more information, what will be maybe a bit different this year. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Thank Bye. You. Bye. 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 Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Um, yeah. I don't know, because you are the host. Yeah.
Oh mein Gott. Ja, you are. Ja, ich bin der Host. Okay, und jetzt? Ähm, quit. Just quit. Aber wenn ich quitte, was passiert dann mit, äh, dem, mit der Aufzeichnung? Äh, Warte, ich mache mal eine Pause.